Welcome back, big girls. Today, we're diving into eight of my favorite running back sleepers for 2024 fantasy football. In order to qualify for this list, you must be getting drafted at pick 110 or later. So we are into the triple digits, all right? That is what we're talking about when it comes to sleepers. You've heard the name of everybody on this list, hopefully, but these are guys obviously going undervalued, all right? So these are the dudes you got to stop sleeping on. We got eight of them. It's going to be a fantastic show for you this morning. Let's talk them. Let's flex them. Let's get it. And just a real quick note, uh, this upcoming Saturday, we're doing our first live trivia event out here in NYC. So if you are in the tri-state area and you want to come say what's up, you want to be a part of the event. We've got uh, us, Snapback Sports, Underdog Fantasy, Fantasy Life, Nerd Sesh. Uh, we're all going to be competing against each other in a big NFL trivia tournament. All right. So uh, we've got a few tickets left. If you happen to be interested, we're basically having the tournament for a few hours. Then we're hanging out on the rooftop of the bar for the rest of the evening. All right. So if you've ever wanted to come hang out, say what's up, uh, you know, just quick little meet and greet, whatnot, uh, this would be the time to do it. So go to bdge.shop for some tickets. But we're here to talk about sleepers. And I know y'all are probably not here to talk about Ezekiel Elliott, but I am. OK, I am right now. And this Dallas Cowboys backfield is one that is completely just void of of guys that we feel comfortable getting touches right now Zeke is going off the board as the 118th pick he's basically like RB 40 ish territory here's the way I'll put this there's just no reason not to leave every single one of your fantasy drafts with either Ezekiel Elliott or Rico Dowdle who is going past pick 140 so it is partly I like Zeke but it's also partly there is just so much opportunity in this backfield that someone is going to play well when it when it comes to fantasy production, okay? When we look at the last three years of just pure running back opportunities in this Dallas backfield, last year was a down year, and running backs got 470 opportunities. The year prior, 547. The year prior, 523. So on average, this running back group, and this is just the running backs. This is not factoring in any goal line carries or any of that kind of stuff for you know Dak or any wide receivers, whatever. 513 opportunities, so targets and carries combined. 19 goal line carries a year. We're talking about per year. 18 total touchdowns and 2,349 yards from scrimmage per year. Dallas last year was literally the number one scoring offense in the NFL. It wasn't San Fran. It wasn't Miami. It wasn't Baltimore or Detroit. It was the Dallas Cowboys. All right. Does Zeke have any sort of you know explosive ceiling? Probably not. But can he go for a thousand total yards from scrimmage? You know, 800, 850 on the ground. 200 through the air and score double digit touchdowns just because this team is so good. Yes, 1000% within his range of outcomes. And I don't think it's actually that unlikely unless they, if they end, end up adding a veteran, you know, within the next like couple of weeks or the next month or something like that, someone that gives competition to this backfield, then we're definitely pushing away a little bit. But as it stands right now, like I think he can easily have a Gus Edwards type year. I, I don't see a reason why he can't be this year's Gus Edwards in this offense that I think is going to be unbelievably explosive and give up a bajillion opportunities on the goal line. So Zeke is my number one player. But again, I also would throw Rico Dowdle on this list. If you miss out on Zeke and Rico drops to the 15th, 16th round, I also just want pieces of this absolutely unknown backfield, which leads us to backfield number two in Cincinnati. And that is Chase Brown, the 120th player off the board with Joe Mixon gone. We look at an opportunity share. We look at, we look at a guy. Let me tell you about this guy. He has averaged over 20 opportunities per game during his seven-year tenure out there in Cincinnati. That is so much work relative to the way that running backs get work nowadays. And they signed Zach Moss, and I like Zach Moss, but Zach Moss realistically has had, in, in his like three, four-year window of being in the NFL, he had about a four-week window last year where he was good. I think small sample sizes are the devil when it comes to fantasy football, okay? And when I look at Chase Brown, I think he has real upside just given his depth chart spot, the number two on the depth chart, and then his athletic profile and his youth relative to Zach Moss, okay? So you look at a guy who's built 5'10", 210 pounds, ran a 4'4", 340, so he's fast, he's explosive, he's super athletic. And he here's the thing, like fantasy football is a spectrum. I know that phrase gets thrown around a lot nowadays outside of fantasy football. Fantasy football is a spectrum. And it's not necessarily that I sit here and say, oh, I think Chase Brown is way better than Zach Moss, or I think Zach Moss is amazing, or I think Zach Moss sucks. It's, it's about placing chips. You know, you're at a poker table, you're placing chips uh, in smart places and hoping that the outcome more often than not falls into your favor. 
And I think you can easily tell the story of Chase Brown starting the year. Like Zach Moss is the thumper. He's probably the goal line guy. First and second down. He gets a lot of work like he did in Indy early last year without JT. Chase Brown is the two and four minute drill back. Chase Brown is the pass catching back. Chase Brown is the guy who's, you know, when the offense is up tempo, he's the guy likely on the field. And I will also say, I think there's a good chance that most people aren't talking about it with Joe Mixon now out of town. This, this offense, for whatever reason, despite having like Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, D. Higgins, they still tended to go through Joe Mixon. Like first down, they were getting the Joe Mixon carry out the way. Like they needed to get it off their chest. They were always like a slow tempo team because it felt like they were always forcing the ball to Joe Mixon. I think there's a real chance that this team goes way more up-tempo, way more pass-heavy in neutral game scripts, and that, I think, would benefit Chase Brown more than it would Zach Moss. So when I look at the history of Cincy, like they've always used a third-down pass-catching back, whether it was Geo back in the day, whether it was Samaje Piran, you know, like they've always wanted to use some sort of back similar to Chase Brown, and those backs won whenever they got the opportunity, ended up smashing in fantasy football. But I also think there's a way, there's a chance that Chase Brown starts the year as that guy. He ends up showing a little bit more explosion than Zach Moss and then continues to chip away at the starting lineup and gets more gets more work than Zach Moss towards the end of the year. Okay, This offense should score a lot, too, and I think that's what made Joe Mixon really, really valuable over the years is just this crazy amount of goal line carries that he has gotten historically okay and yeah I think Zach Moss probably starts the year with those but again it's about it's about putting chips on different parts of the spectrum you look at the good you look at the bad you look at Chase Brown's upside you look at the offense you look at his explosiveness and you start to say like hey there's something there hopefully it can hit right these guys are getting picked 120 130 140 there's a reason they're they're that far down the list it's because they're not likely to hit but these are the players that if there are going to be guys that hit down that far in the draft, it is dudes like Chase Brown that have that sort of upside, that that explosive upside, similar to the next guy up on this list, Jerome Ford. He is sort of a runway runner. If you give him a hole, he is going to blast through it. And somehow he's going off the board after Chase Brown. I think Jerome Ford might single-handedly be my favorite pick in fantasy football drafts right now. He's going outside of the, the first 120 picks. It blows my mind that he's all the way down there. Uh, he proved last year with Nick Chubb out that he could handle all three downs. I mean, he was second in the NFL in receiving touchdowns, only behind Christian McCaffrey. I I am of the belief I am always an injury pessimist. Y'all know this. I think the easiest way to avoid scams and frauds in fantasy football is to stop buying into all the injury hype of how every player is going to be 100% when, you know, when training camp rolls around and week one rolls around. These guys take forever to get back to full strength, both mentally and physically, and Nick Chubb's injury was diabolical and he's old okay so I don't see a world where Nick Chubb has a real impact on this team at least not over like the first half of the year if he is getting real carries at any point it's week 10 or beyond and even if that if you want to make that huge argument I think Jerome Ford proved last year that he could have a super similar role to Kareem Hunt and all the success that Kareem Hunt had behind Nick Chubb during all those years in Cleveland all right with Jerome Ford, he's explosive, he's big, he can catch passes, he's literally already proven to be a good fantasy running back. He was a top 18 fantasy running back last year, despite not getting like, you know, 80% of the work. He he just was extremely efficient and was valuable in the valuable parts of the field when asked to be, okay? So Jerome Ford at 120 makes absolutely no sense. I feel like you're going to be able to draft him and put him into your starting lineup, E immediately i just got a text from con ed con ed we're preparing for the heat wave in your area this week it's about it's gonna be like 95 today in new york please limit your energy use between 2 p.m and 10 p.m you want me to shut off my ac when when i go to bed um, it's sunday right now it's sunday it's 8 55 in the morning sunday morning i'm fucking here yapping to you about jerome ford chase brown i work pretty fucking hard i think i work this hard just so that i can keep my air conditioning on 24 7 when the summer hits so con ed's gonna tell me to not put it on until 2 p.m what the fuck you want me to do in my apartment till 2 p.m with no fucking ac on and then as soon as i go to bed i turn it off fuck that fuck that leave it for the peasants I'm out here talking about Jerome Ford because I want my AC turned on. All right? Fuck Con Ed. All my homies hate Con Ed. So the fourth back on this list, Kendra Miller, ADP of 133. I'm going to be honest here. This is the guy. I think he's probably got like the biggest headline name on this list. And I think he'll be on this list for a lot of breakout or sleeper type videos. If, you, if you're, you know, kind of dabbling in the industry and watching a lot of people's videos. He's probably the player that I'm least bullish on on this entire list, despite 
liking him the most of any player coming out of college on this list. Like, out of TCU, I kind of was obsessed with Kendra Miller. But he has had very li little positive takeaway in his time in the NFL. Very little, you know, just positive metric stats analysis that you can really pull from and be like, hell yeah, this is this is what Kendra can build on. He had like a good game in week 18. Uh, the Saints beat the fucking pulp out of us, the Falcons, by like 30. He ran for 73 yards and a touchdown, which was cool, but neither Alvin Kamara nor Jamal Williams were playing. I guess like what I'm kind of latching on to is my tape evaluation when I watched him coming out of TCU. I thought he was a really, really, really good in-between-the-tackles runner, made guys miss, never really caught passes, which is what kind of scares me. He is a day two pick, and I think those are the types of guys you take double-digit round shots on when it comes to running backs and fantasy. The tough part about this sell, really, and I should have just now, now that I'm talking about it, I haven't said a single fucking positive thing about him, so he probably just shouldn't have been on this list. But Jamal Williams is on the Saints roster through 2024. They're, they would lose more money than they would uh, have to spend money if they just cut him. Unless unless someone like trades for him for whatever reason, which I don't really see what that happening coming off of last year. Uh, so as long as Jamal Williams is there, I don't know where like Kendra's role really lies. Is he like a committee early down back? Because he was never a pass catcher coming out of school. So even if you think Kamara is dust, there's just no chance he's earning that role over Kamara. So it's like... Their offensive line is pretty bad. I don't know how this offense is going to be. Not a lot of good going on here. So you know what? We're actually going to wipe. So this video is going to be seven running back sleepers and one guy to fucking never draft when you're at pick 130. Now, I'll sprinkle in some Kendra Miller if I'm on underdog and I'm like doing a bunch of drafts. You know, at the same time, I got 10 of them going. And I'm like, all right, you know what? Let me get one, two shares of, of a little Kendra Miller action stain. That's when I'll probably go in on him. Otherwise, I would actually probably avoid him now that I'm really saying this out loud now we've gone through four if you just want to not hear me yap if you just want the straight info the goods we have a section within our draft guide which just went available for pre-order on bdge.co where it's just our favorite picks from pick 100 and later so we'll have all of our favorite sleepers running back wide receiver quarterback tight end like every pick that we love pick 100 or later is in the draft guide okay and that one available for a discounted price on bdge.co, the pre-order price is available until August 1st. So it's $25 now. It'll be an extra $10 once August 1st hits. However, the cheapest and the least expensive way to get it is if you are a first-time depositor on Underdog Fantasy. You go over to underdogfantasy.com or you download the app and you use our code BDGE. Not only is that, that going to get you a bunch of deposit bonuses on there so you can draft with us. Like I said, if you've got 10 drafts going at once, you'll be prepped as fuck for your actual draft. And you could dabble in some dudes like Kendra Miller every once in a while. They hit you with some deposit bonuses when you use our code, but you'll also get the draft guide absolutely free when it goes live on August 1st. So, you know, it's got all of our favorite sleepers, running backs, wide receivers, quarterback, tight ends. It's got our rankings, obviously, super flex, one quarterback, PPR, half PPR, all that kind of shit. It's got a million different things in there. We're really, really excited about rolling out this tool we're calling the tiebreaker matrix as well so when you're on the clock and you're trying to decide between like two or three guys you can compare them in one chart and it'll show you you know offensive line strength offensive pace uh fantasy playoff schedule whether or not it's you know really really good so hopefully that will help you make your tiebreaker choice when you are on the clock but all this is available on bdge.co pre-order for a discounted price right now right today right here right now again or go to underdog fantasy Code BDGE. Let's talk about Jaleel McLaughlin. Pick 153 out there in Denver. Jaleel showed like some real, real flashes last year. He was kind of the GOAT when you look at the metrics. His true yards per carry, number four in the NFL. Yards per touch, 10. Juke rate, which is just elusiveness, number six in the NFL. Breakaway run rate, the percentage of runs that he had that went for breakaway runs. 13th in the NFL. Yards created per touch, number six in the NFL. Like, Really, 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 really good on obviously a limited sample size. And the elephant in the room here is not Julio because of his size, but it is the fact that his backfield is just messy as fuck, right? We don't really know how it'll play out. Javante will probably lead the lead. If I had to bet money on how this backfield plays out, Javante leads the team in touches by the end of the year. He has 240, 230, 240 touches, ends up being... An RB three ish scores like six touchdowns, maybe some something in that range. Uh, Samaj Pirine, who knows if he's going to be on the roster come August? They drafted Audric Estime out of Notre Dame, who I, I like Audric for what he is. He's a bigger back, day three guy, but he's already out of camp with a with a real injury. So who knows when he's going to be back? 
Uh, there's some hype around this kid, Blake Watson. He's an undrafted free agent, similar, very similar build to Jaleel McLaughlin, and he's just doing the same thing that Jaleel did last year. So there's a couple of guys here that won't make the roster. Uh, can I bet who it is? I don't know. They've they've got to trim some fat here. Cecil Lammy, who is one of the more trusted Denver beat reporters, came out and he says the top Denver running back looks like Jaleel McLaughlin. Will Javante Williams even make the team? That's outrageous. There's just no chance that Javante Williams is the one that gets cut here. But the sentiment being like, they see Jaleel being a real part of this backfield. They see him performing really well in OTAs and training camp coming up. Like, I think he could have a real role in an offense that's probably going to have to play catch up more often than not. And obviously, again, this could change very, very quickly based on uh, guys getting cut or if they add somebody, something like that. But I think last year, Jaleel McLaughlin gave this offense some, some real juice that they needed badly. And I think that they're going to rely on him to do that again this year, even if it's in a third down capacity, getting, you know, seven, eight, nine carries per game. Uh, loved what we saw last year. So down here at pick like 150, 150 plus, love me a little Lily. Next guy up on this list. And if you're joining us for redraft videos, like you're just getting back up to speed and you haven't been watching our Dynasty stuff, we have a completely separate channel for Dynasty fantasy football stuff now, which I'll link down below. You probably have no fucking idea who this guy is. Kamani Vidal. Kamani Vidal is a sixth round pick from Troy that got selected by the Los Angeles Chargers this year. He's gotten a lot of steam in the dynasty community, and I, I would expect his name to start popping up on these lists in the redraft community sooner rather than later. He is currently going outside of the top 170 picks. So if you're in any type of like real friends or family leagues, he's not going to get drafted, but he should be on your board. Because when you look at the Chargers' backfield, Austin Eckler's gone. Again, I'm going to I'm gonna keep this basic. This is like recapping fantasy football for idiots. Because I know a lot of people are just starting to get back into it. A lot of people, honestly, will probably watch this video like late August. And this will come up on their feed. So I want to make sure that everybody's up to speed. So if you're a fucking genius, you have a huge brain, and you know what's been going on since May, relax, all right? Sometimes I just want to talk to people that are normal also. Not me, but there are normal people out there. Kamani Bidal. Gus Edwards was signed by the Chargers, as was J.K. Dobbins. Gus Edwards is 29 years old. He's coming off of a big touchdown season, but it was his most inefficient season as an actual runner, and I think the cliff is here for him. True yards per carry, he ranked 37th. Elusiveness, 51st. Breakaway run rate, 27th. Yards created per touch, 45th, whatever. J.K. Dobbins is also coming off of like six back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back uh, season-ending injuries. So I have zero confidence that he stays healthy, nor even makes the roster. When you look at Kamani Vidal, 5'8", 213 pounds, all right? Dude is compact. That BMI in the 91st percentile. So despite being 5'8", like I'm not worried about his size because he is a fucking bowling ball, okay? Really athletic, 4-4-6 speed, bursty, agile. His best comp you could see up there is Isaiah Pacheco. He is Troy's all-time leading rusher, and he had 18 or more catches in all four seasons. Over 20 catches in three out of four seasons. Like He was their entire offense, and he was able to do it on all three downs. This is also in L.A. Again, if you're just joining us, they signed Harbaugh as their head coach from Michigan. Uh, they got Greg Roman. In the NFL draft, they opted to go with Joe Alt over uh, Malik Neighbors type. So this is going to be an extremely, extremely run-heavy offense, all right? There's room for multiple backs to have real opportunities in L.A. And listen, I know him being – he was a six-round pick, like late day three pick. There's no guarantee that he even makes the roster. When I look at like J.K. Dobbins's contract, though, there's no guarantee he makes the roster. I think he's he's guaranteed like forty thousand dollars this offseason if he were to get cut. So they still have a bunch of schlubs like fucking uh, Isaiah Spiller and like a bunch of bums like that. But I think this offseason, uh, the roster and the depth chart will work itself out very, 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 very quickly. Uh, to the point where you'll continue to hear this guy's name. And again, I'm not like overly obsessed with a six round pick, but he is someone who I think brings something to the offense or brings something to that backfield that they don't have. And that is size, explosiveness, uh, production, all that kind of stuff meddled with a team that's going to run the shit out of the ball and a team that has nothing up top on the depth chart besides Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins and the ghost of everybody who's ever been a bad running back for the L.A. Chargers. So make him your last round pick in the majority of your drafts. And if you miss out on him, can I interest you in another shitty, compact, small, miniature running back with a lot better draft capital? And that is Clyde Edwards Hilaire. He's going around pick 200. Now, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. Please don't turn the video off. And if you do, if you hear Clyde and you're like, I got to get the fuck out of here, all I ask is that you hit the button, the thumbs up button down below first uh, and subscribe to the channel because we're going to be doing the same 
video again for wide receivers tomorrow. So if you want to see that, if you want to hear that, please subscribe. Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I am all in on Pacheco this year. I'm all in, right? He is like my favorite running back not being picked inside the top 10 running backs. I think he has legitimate top five, top three fantasy upside in that offense with his role. However, there have been so many running backs in the Chiefs' Andy Reid-led offense that have excelled, that have had stints where they are like the guy, even if it's for like two, three, four weeks at a time that we just never would have expected, all right? Like, let me hit you with some Kansas City backs that have been relevant at some point or another in fantasy over like the last eight years. That you're about to get hit with a heavy wave of nostalgia right now. You ready? Isaiah Pacheco, Jarek McKinnon, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, Darrell Williams, Derek Gore, Damian Williams, like actually the GOAT, Spencer Ware, Kareem Hunt, Charkandrick West, Niall Davis, and obviously, you know, Jamal Charles. Just a list of dudes that. If you've been playing fantasy for the last decade, every single one of those will like give you a little bolt of electricity. You knew where you were the day you woke up and won the blind bid for Charkhandrick motherfucking West, okay? So when I think of this backfield, again, I try not to play fantasy in absolutes. It's not, okay, Pacheco is the guy. He's the only guy. There is literally no other way anybody could succeed. It's just not true. It's not how the Andy Reid offense always works. It works that way sometimes when they have a really good back. Jamal Charles getting fed. Kareem Hunt was getting fed. Like when they have a guy that they want to be the guy, they tend to get fed. But there's also this like this weird thing with the Chiefs offense where it's like if they have a role opened up that they don't feel comfortable giving, like let's say Pacheco, they're just like, ah, we don't really want to give you the two and four minute drill snaps. They will just give it to the next guy up on the depth chart. They have just forced guys like Damian Williams, Darrell Williams. Like all these guys have just become premier pass catching backs, not because they're good at it, but just because the Chiefs said, fuck it, we're giving you that role. And now you're going to catch four to five passes a game just because. And when you look at the depth chart, here's here's really why it's like Clyde is the same as Damian Pierce in Houston, where it's like you don't want to draft him, but there's just literally behind the workhorse up front, there's nothing behind them, okay? So you have Pacheco, you have Clyde, and then nothing, like literally nothing on the depth chart. So I wouldn't be surprised if Clyde's role came down to just being a pass catching back because that's what he was good at in college, and he'll he'll be pretty good in that role if that's all they ask him to do. You know they're like Miami where they get really shifty in the red zone, they get really creative, and it's like, sure, if they're on the one-yard line and they're handing it to a running back, it's probably Pacheco, but when they're on the 13-yard line and they want to have three guys in motion, like there's a decent chance that Clyde ends up getting a, a, a wheel route or something like that. So I think there's a lot of flexibility here for both guys to produce uh, Clyde more so in PPR and one of the underlying or the added benefits of Clyde is that I think he's a clear handcuff if you decide to take Isaiah Pacheco early where you can't say that about a ton of backfields like you take Derrick Henry who is who is the real handcuff Keaton Mitchell coming off the ACL Justice Hill he'll never have a real workload Rasheen Ali like there's a lot of dudes up top that maybe you feel kind of scared for to draft and they don't have a clear handcuff so if you take Pacheco early Clyde is the handcuff behind him, okay? And there's a chance that Clyde has standalone value. There's a chance he doesn't, but there is that added benefit of him being number two on the depth chart in a fucking phenomenal offense and him being the real handcuff here, okay? So those are the, I don't know how many I named, actually. I might have named six. I might have named fucking 14 at this point. But those are my favorite sleepers at the running back position getting picked 110 or later. Again, we're doing the same thing for wide receivers tomorrow, so make sure you're subscribed and make sure that if you like this list and you want all of our best information just in one spot, just coddled for you, head over to bdge.co to pre-order the draft guide. Or again, if you are in an eligible state, the least expensive way to get it is on underdogfantasy.com or by downloading the app. The link will be in the description. It'll take you right there. And when you deposit $10 or more, They'll hit you with deposit bonuses, but they'll also get you that draft guide absolutely for free with the deposit come August 1st when it goes live. Pause. And again, if you're in the tri-state area, bdge.shop. bdge.shop for live trivia event tickets. Hopefully, I'll see y'all on Saturday. If not, fucking enemies forever. But I still love you. Smokies.